know, SNAP benefits. And so that's probably where I'm going to start. Um, one of the things, and I want to piggyback for those of you who just um, had the opportunity to listen to Secretary Brown, one, I, you know, I, I don't get the chance to talk much about, um, you know, people that you really come to admire. And I've gotten a chance over the past two years to work with, I'm um, fairly close to the Secretary Brown. And I'm good Lord, you know, how lucky are we and, um, as a state to have someone who is, um, candidly could go off and do a lot of other things, make a lot more money, or if he just wanted to sell in the back deck, I don't mean he could, but um, someone who has you know, 30, almost 40 years of state government experience that understands um, almost every nickel of the state budget. And for him to be there at a time when we are facing so many challenges is just absolutely amazing. Um, I think the fact that he has the respect that he does um, just allows us to move forward at a much quicker pace and with a lot less skepticism than we would be able to do otherwise. Um, so I'm going to piggyback. I know that he talked a little bit about health reform and what we're going to have to do unless the court um, decides, and we just found this out today, um, next June, that you know, the, 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 the nation will be moving forward with health reform. Since day one, since the governor took office, he understood that it was the law of the land, it is the law of the land. Um, he doesn't agree with the law. Um, and you, you know, don't agree with, with the law. But you know, as an attorney um, and as a legislator, you know, the most responsible thing to do is to implement. Because if we don't implement, then the federal government takes over. Um, and we just can't have that happen. And that's not political rhetoric that, that I'm you know, bringing here. It's just reality. We know better how to take care of Virginians, especially those who are, in many cases, some of our most vulnerable in our populations than anyone else. Um, and that's really within the Secretary of Health and Human Resources, what, um, what we do. I had someone <clears throat> tell me recently, said, I don't understand why the Secretary of Staff is so keyed up, um, and, it was, and they responded very simply, well, because they're dealing with lives. Um, and, and, and I don't know how to play that too much, but we do feel uh, a great responsibility that those individuals who are on Medicaid, those individuals who are receiving, you know, SNAP benefits, um, those individuals who, and, and y'all um, have many of these institutions who are at our um, mental health institutions, um, our training centers, um, our local community service boards that are, you know, working tirelessly to take care of, you know, those in our society who um, maybe have not gotten as fair or break it as they should have. And so we take that responsibility very seriously. And, and when we work with our partners, um, we know the limits of resources that they have, we know the limits of resources that we have, and it's just never enough. Uh, and so as we look toward health reform, it, it does you know, give us pause and it, um, and, it, and it scares us even more because you know, it fronts the numbers. Um, and though at the beginning of the implementation of health reform, it doesn't break the bank of the state, it does in the long term. And, and I don't know if Secretary Brown went over the numbers that we, you know, we estimate that it's going to be north of, of $2 billion, um, what it's going to cost the state over the next 10 years. Now, what's interesting about that number is that's just the cost to take care of the, um, you know, those, the 425,000 individuals or up to 425,000 individuals that will potentially come on Medicaid rolls. We've kind of used the number 270 to 425, um, but I think as we get closer, we believe it's going to be on the higher end of that number. And for localities, for us, it's very scary um, to, you know, to say, okay, the place that they usually go to enroll is the local department of social services. And we know right now that even due to the, you know, to, to the economic downturn, that your local DSS offices are already overworked. Um, so you have staff that's overworked, um, in many cases underpaid. Um, I suspect, you know, the, the good folks, um, but you know, maybe morale's not exactly where it needs to be. And um, thank you for shaking your heads, at least on, on, on one person, on one right trip. Um, it, that they're underpaid, but you know, and they want to do the right thing, but they don't have the technology that they need to do the job that I, we believe that they want to do. Um, so I, I, I know that so it's one of the good things uh, about the health reform, you know, bill was that it did it has provided 
presenting an opportunity, and this will be good regardless of if health reform is struck down or not, to invest in a um, in, in an automated social service portal that will take us away, hopefully, by and large, from the paper process that we currently have, which is very time intensive and also has a significant um, error rate, both for individuals who are attempting to go on Medicaid rolls and for individuals who should not be on Medicaid rolls. It goes both ways. Um, I wish that the 16% error rate that we currently have um, statewide is one that was just based um, on those individuals who should not be on the roll because it would be a remarkable cost savings to the Commonwealth once this social service portal came in. But the reality is, is that um, we believe it goes both ways um, and, and we don't, we're not anticipating any great cost savings. We believe the efficiencies um, will come ultimately as you know, the, all of this technology comes online. So the, the federal government's paying for it. They are paying, they're paying for 90% of that. And the state is picking up the other 10%. So for example, last year, the state an investment of $5 million and we will receive around 30% of that nature. I'm not, I'm not that great around the, you know, the, the finance like he is, but um, we're going to need some additional investments of that. Um, the first portions of that will be rolled out um, in the spring. We did talk to um, the Baker. We did talk to the leadership. I mean, uh, Dean last week about this, and we're going to have some continued conversations. What we don't want to occur as we begin to roll this out um, is for the locals to not understand what's going on. So we're going to need your input um, on that. And to, to figure out the best way to, to make that process go forward because people's jobs are going to change. But we have heard over and over and over again from the local um, departments of social service that you know our system is broken, um, on some broken level, and we need to do something about it. And Secretary Hazel, <clears throat> he's a aside from being a retired orthopedic surgeon, he did major in engineering and he, he really understands the mechanics of this stuff. And so and, and he also likes it a lot. So that this is something that we're very, very excited about. Um, one of the things that Secretary Brown also hit on that I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about, because we're going to need your help with this, is the Department of Justice has um, came, into the, came into the state the last few years, and they really looked at our training centers. And we have five training centers in the state. Um, they're, they're, we have one in Northern Virginia. We have one um, in South Side of Virginia and or, uh, Southern Virginia. Peter, Petersburg, we have one. Um, in uh, Central Virginia, which is in Lynchburg, we have one in Southeastern Virginia, um, down in the exact city. I always get in trouble when I do this, but it's um, down in the peninsula. Um, it's not directly in Norfolk. And then we have one more that's in I mean, again, Northern Virginia, Southeastern Virginia, Central Virginia, Southern Virginia. Which one did I miss? Southwest. Southwest. Southwest Virginia, sorry. Um, I should know that because I've been on five of them. And basically, basically the Department of Justice is telling us that we have 1,000 and about 1,100 individuals that are currently residing in the training centers, and that we have not, as a state, done enough to allow them options to live in the community. Well, we know that if we make the decision as a state to downsize these training centers, or in some cases um, have the training centers closed, that we're going, um, that it's going to come at a significant cost that's going to be spread, you know, all across the, all across the state. Um, it's going to be a large burden on the community service force. We could, you know, we could easily hand over, you know, the money and say, go do this, but, you know, and, and y'all know this very well, you can fund a lot of things, but it doesn't mean that you're going to end up with good results. Um, and so, you know, we acknowledge, and the state acknowledges that I, we can always do more, um, particularly for those individuals who are intellectually and developmentally disabled. And I think we want to handle more. Governor McDonald, and, uh, along with um, many, many, many legislators around the state, Kirk Cox was probably the, the chief patron and, and champion, and, um, and Senator Northern ended up appropriating about $60 million last year to you know, do any number of things. Fund waiver slots. We've got a waiting list of about 6,000 individuals on that. On that, um, but we also need to be able to take care of those that are currently in the community 
and have them not be at risk of entering these institutions if they don't want to. So there's a number of programs, crisis stabilization units, for example, that we are creating um, to try to take care of some of those issues. Um, we're not yet to the end of our discussions with the Department of Justice. We had thought that the, they would only go on about three or four months, but this is this issue is much like an onion. The more you know, one layer you peel back, it just continues to um, you know get deeper and deeper and um, we hope that we're going to be there by the first part of December with them to be able to come out with some resolution one way or the other. But regardless, and this is really where where I've come down on this subject, having um, worked on it, you know, for well over a year now, is that we, we can do more as a commonwealth. The governor wants to do more. He does believe that many of the individuals, um, or a significant force of the individuals living in the training centers, can live in the community, can live. Um, a full life. That's not to condemn what's going on at these training centers. So I don't want to leave here today with the impression that the McDonald administration is for closing all the training centers because that's not it um, at all. That um, it, it's very difficult to financially run two systems of care, one in the training centers and then one um, in, in the community. And so we're trying to figure out what the balance, best balance is is for that. And so um, you know, I went down to the Southwest Virginia Training Center, and the way the community embraces, embraces that, you know, that facility is absolutely amazing. And, um, we're, we're really trying to operate under the, uh, we really just don't want to do any harm to the system because there are there are, there are very good pieces of it, and so um, and the Virginia Training Center is another good example of that. Central Virginia Training Center in Lynchburg, I think what we have there is we have. Um, you know, some really good pieces of Central Virginia where they've done some renovations recently. And then we also have um, some older buildings that are even, they're not being used right now. And so we're in the middle of just trying to transition a system. And, um, and those things are, are never cheap. And so we're going to need to have a lot of talks, a lot of good talks about that as we you know, move forward. Um, one of the things that the governor always talks about, and he talked about a lot of the campaign trail, was Medicaid reform. Um, you know, how do we, you know, stop this you know, increase in this out of control spending? You know, that we're dealing with there are 900,000 plus individuals on Medicaid. I believe those numbers for you, if you count also the Children's Health Insurance Program. I think we also have that many individuals who are receiving SNAP benefits. I probably know better than I do. And so, if you take the 900,000 people on Medicaid. And then we have another million that are uninsured. We have eight million Virginians. Um, so we have two, you know, close to two million people who are either uninsured or on Medicaid. And then we add the 400,000. That's going to put us in over 200,000 individuals out of eight million that are either on some type of public assistance or are uninsured. And a lot of people ask this: When health reform comes through, does that mean that nobody will be uninsured? No, it only takes us down to maybe right, you know, half if you do those numbers. So we're still going to have another 400,000 people that are, you know, making their way to hospital emergency rooms. They're going to be, you know, to our free clinics. Um, many of you have fairly qualified health centers um, in your districts that you run and, and help fund. And these places are still going to be needed. Um, if anything, they're going to be needed even more after health reform goes through because we know that we don't have enough practitioners out there to, to deal with. Um, you know, to the influx of patients that we're dealing with. Because Medicaid does not pay uh, practitioners, you know, their cost of care for treating these patients. So we are particularly concerned that physicians are going to be overwhelmed by the um, those coming onto the rolls. And what will happen is the Medicaid recipients will flock to the emergency room, will flock to the free clinics, will flock to the federally qualified health center. Um, because if you haven't heard, you know, you know, kind of maybe there's going to be a double dip recession. And we don't, you know, we just had the stimulus money that um, ran out, and so we're trying to, <clears throat> to fill a hole in Medicaid. And, that, and so we're not going to, you know, we don't believe to be able to raise the rates to really maybe entice these providers to come on to the rolls. Now, hospitals are in a real quandary, and y'all will need to, you know, watch this closely because they, by, they by federal law, um, TALA have to treat. Um, any patient when they present on the campus. Now, they don't have to do everything for them. Uh, they just have to stabilize them. But to be, you know, to be honest, 
we all you know, know our good hospitals, particularly good community hospitals, they're going to do more than just stabilize. And they're going to do whatever it takes um, to take care of the patients. And so you know, that's really, um, you know, and we don't have, you know, the Secretary of talks about, he doesn't have a switch in his office that creates doctors, that creates physician assistants, that creates nurse practitioners. Um, we are hopeful that we are going to work on you know, some increasing you know, scope of practice that some of our providers, um, particularly nurse practitioners, can get them to where they are practicing at their level um, of you know, training. But again, that is not going to solve the problem. Um, I'll, I'll use Henry County for, for as an example. Um, you know, terrible unemployment in Henry County, like me, places in the state. Um, we already know from some of the modeling that's been done that they are going to have a significant amount of individuals with federal health reform that are going to come on Medicaid rolls. Um, there aren't going to be enough physicians. Um, enough, you know, they're not, they're not going to be enough nurses. There aren't going to be enough anybody in, in that area. So how will those individuals be treated? Well, sadly, they may have to drive. Um, and it's just going to be, you know, have to be a work in progress. So, you know, that's, if you can't tell because, you know, I'm harping on it a little bit, that's really, you know, what keeps us up at night in the Health and Human Resources Secretary is, you know, how are we going um, to take care of these individuals? How's the state going to fund it? Um, I mentioned two things, the DOJ investigation, and we also have the federal health reform. And I can tell you that those are multi-billion dollar um, propositions in a, in a state that I can assure you that, you know, just like your localities, um, where revenues are down. Um, we also have the issue, and, and y'all deal with this so much, um, of you know, we're not entirely sure that we are where we are funding care for individuals, whether for, whether it's through the Comprehensive Services Act um, or, or to you know, those individuals who are on Medicaid receiving medical, medical treatment. Um, if we get into the Comprehensive Services Act, we're spending about $300 million a year. Um, but we're not really collecting data to show, you know, what, what the outcomes are for these children. Um, and that's something that I think that the governor is really going um, to begin to work on this year. And we, and we want to be partners in this. Uh, at the Government Reform Commission meeting today, that um, the panel did adopt about seven or eight principles. And I really, if I'd you know, been thinking clearly and knew that they were absolutely going to adopt it, I would have um, made copies and, and, and brought them to y'all. It's something that I can definitely send out. Um, <clears throat> we really need y'all's input on that. We've already talked to Dean and we're going to you know, begin to have a dialogue on that. Um, because what we don't want to do is we don't want to do, we don't want to do things like the federal government does to us where they come up with what they believe is a great program and then they <coughs> tell the state to implement it and we go, if you just ask us, <laughs> we might have been able to give you, the, you know, a couple of good ideas. And so, I think that's you know that's the way we want to look at it. Um, you know we do have some some broad ideas, um, data collection. Um, I'm going to say something that might terrify some folks: um, the opportunity to do some care coordination potentially um, within with this population. Um, we've had success with that with the Medicaid recipients. Um, we're not saying that this is you know definitely the way, but we do want to try to figure out some broad principles that localities can agree on. Um, to see if possibly this is, if this is the direction that we want to go in. But I will tell you, the number one thing that we want to do is we've got to get data on you know, these kids and figuring, and figuring out where the outcomes are. Um, we can't just continue to fund you know, things without knowing you know, how well things are going. And, and that's really you know, the, um, you know, what we want to do. Um, other things that we're, that we're dealing with that we want, you know, that we'd like to be on the to look out for within, <coughs> within the Department of Rehabilitative Services. Um, Commissioner Rock, Rothrock is working with a lot of wounded warriors. Um, one of the things that we know happens as they you know, come, out, come off the battlefield is that they end up with a lot of mental health um, issues. And a lot of times they will move from urban areas to rural areas because candidly they just want peace and quiet. And I don't feel like an issue is a lot of times we don't have those mental health services in the rural areas like we do um, in certain, some of the urban areas. We're going to need to figure that out. Um, we've got a lot of problems within the delivery of mental health services to begin with, and we're going to have to work on that. Um, it, a lot of you probably understand the, the issue of bed space um, when individuals you know, have episodes, 
and maybe they just need a short stay in a hospital. Hospitals don't have as many beds available as they used to. Um, and so the community service board become overwhelmed with that too. And so we're going to try to hopefully tackle that within the upcoming session. Um, but again, you know, for these veterans that come back, I, I think we're, we're going to have to look long and hard about how we, we ensure that they re-enter society um, in a way that where it's welcoming. Um, they get that they need some job training, um, brain injury. Um, I think that during tough times, the General Assembly has done a pretty good job of funding some of these services. Um, I was just at the uh, new medical school of Virginia Tech and the research that they are doing on brain injury is absolutely amazing. Um, and I think that's something that candidly the nation is going to be proud of. Uh, I got the opportunity to witness a gentleman, and he, got, he, he actually showed the governor this. And, um, he, he had a, um, a helmet, and what, we're, what he's looking to do, and this is the simplest way to look at it, is um, you, know, you have the helmet on, and, and you're in the battlefield, and something happens, you get knocked to the ground. Well, now, you get knocked to the ground, and, 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 you know, you have a, and you shake your head really good. Well, you could be out there a while. Well, what he's trying to do is um, build something that has electrodes in it for basically you know, shock the brain and limit the amount of damage that could be done. Absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, I mean, these are these are kids that are doing this type of stuff. And it, I, I really, I think the um, the the country's going to be proud of this. I mean, it has a lot of uses. That you know, we were close enough to detect these. Well, you know, we actually put this in football helmets um, too down the road. But what he's trying to do it. Do is he said, you know, there's got to be a way to prevent that damage when they're in the field of battle. And so, um, so you know, as these individuals come back from combat, come back from Iraq and, um, and Afghanistan, you know, we need to look out and make sure that we're, we're taking care of them in the proper way. Virginia has more veterans than any other state. Um, and so, you know, we need to make sure that they're taken care of. So, so with that, um, I, I don't want to, you know, ramble on too long. I know I'm also in between you and you know, possibly catching up on your email or heaven forbid someone actually um, enjoy the resort. But I'd love to take questions and you know, it always thrills me to just have a dialogue back and forth. But, so I'll open it up for questions. One question. Sure. Are y'all still tied into North of Roman? The Jews? I really, I really was. Um, <coughs> Secretary of Technology was here, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Secretary Duffy was standing here. Um, yeah, we are. Uh, let's go. And, and I said that's a work in progress. So, uh, hey, hey, L. George Washington Regional Commission. Uh, you know, we're hearing that in the CSA discussions that there's a real hard look at, at moving the cost reimbursement over to, to DMAX. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain how that system would work in local governments getting reimbursed for costs they've already done? And yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's as far along as, as people think it is. Um, and I don't, I don't have the details of exactly how it works because it hasn't been looked at. Um, but I, I will, Karen. Um, I'll have Susie Clare, who's the new head of the Office of Comprehensive Services, get in, get in touch with you. And, you know, she can answer your question. I don't believe that's as far down the road as people might have thought it was at that one particular point. Thank you. I'll, if I need to be corrected, I'll, I'll have somebody correct it. I don't think we're that far down the road. Um, I was a little confused about your comment on uh, today's news. Oh, yeah. I'm going to that. Sorry. I, you know, what I heard was that the Supreme Court uh, agreed to hear the, the health care law. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I thought you were saying the opposite, that you know, it was a paid complaint. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. Um, I apologize. No, they agreed to hear the health care law in, in June of next year. Um, and so this is actually a quicker time frame than you know, we initially thought. Um, there was some concern that it would be the latter part of the <laughs> governor's term. And what we're dealing with, what we're dealing with is the um, the feds are not giving us guidance on a number of things that we need to implement. Um, one thing that um, you may or may not have heard of is this whole thing about the health insurance exchange. Um, we could talk about that for an hour or two, but the feds have not given us any guidance on what a state, what a federal exchange will look like, or what the requirements would be on a state exchange. Uh, and so, how are we supposed to go, go create this thing that? We're required to create until they tell us how you know what it what components need to be in it. So 
we're, we're having you know, some difficult discussions right now with other states um, about well, maybe we'll just decide what we think it should look like. Um, Utah has one, California's working on one, Massachusetts has one, we've, we've heard enough about that on TV. I think the one that um, if we were to do on the one Virginia would want to do would look more like Utah, which is more of, um, you know, uh, we use the word passive and I hate to, to use it, but basically it's a place that people would go, and it's a marketplace that people would shop and it wouldn't be active in the sense that um, we would be going out and trying to get individuals to enroll in the exchange. Basically, we would set it up, insurers would participate, we know they want to participate, um, they would compete in a marketplace much like they, they do now, but it would just be a one-stop shop for individuals to go and, um, and purchase their insurance and they would be able to compare and contrast um, you know, the different rates and plans. Um, that's not a bad concept. It was actually introduced by um, you know, Republicans a while back, but the, the issue is if the um, feds are trying to control the marketplace and not and have too many um, constraints on it, that's not something Virginia's going to want to do. Um, and so and it's not something a, a number of other states are going to want to do. And so we are um, you know, dealing with that right now. So it is good news that we will know in June, um, I, uh, or that we're going to hear it in June, because we were concerned that you know we were looking much farther down the road um, with the, with a little with very little guidance. So, so actually, I heard they're going to have here. Uh, they're going to listen to arguments in March. They're going to rule in June. Oh, they're going to rule in June. Okay. And then they're also going to talk about uh, the Medicaid expansion part, which which I didn't think they were going to do. But they're they're going to look at whether Medicaid expansion makes sense if they rule, if they don't rule on the, uh, the mandate to buy health insurance. I mean, to buy insurance. Okay. Yeah. And again, I was on the road for, for, with this kind of all those details come out early mid. Yeah. So that was on the road. We got more than I did. Is there anything else? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I think they're taking up the whole dang on law. Uh, good. And so are they going to? I mean, I'm, we'll have a back and forth. I'm, I'm hoping that what they're going to do is they're going to look at aspects to where what happens if they rule on one or two things. You know, does it collapse? Um, that's something that we've you know been very concerned about is that you know they could rule on one piece of it, but then you know you still are kind of left the shell of the law. What do you do with that? Um, so that's so that's good news. But uh, yeah, I've gotten a, just a quick an email on that they were going that they were going to take it up. So that's great news. So, yes, sir. Go back on training centers for this moment. Sure. What we did is we're working on this on home individual home locations for intermediate care. Yeah. Is there really a, a deep seated desire to uh, change the central location of the training center for those people who need help on the central care in the long term? Yeah, that's a. Um, did everybody hear that question? Yeah. yeah. Um, there are. There are. It's, it's particularly at the Central Virginia Training Center, there are very medically complex um, individuals that I think some would argue, you know, would be very difficult to treat um, in the community. And there is a very well-run um, ICFMR at Central Board, the equivalent of at the um, skilled nursing facility, actually, at the Central Virginia Training Center that, that takes care of, um, you know, Again, these medically complex individuals, probably the most complex in, in the state, to be fair. They probably have more medically complex individuals than, than, than the other training centers. Um, and so, if you made the decision to try to move individuals into the community, um, there's always been this assumption that it, it would be cheaper. And, and I think bottom works, it would, would be cheaper, but with these medically complex individuals, uh, I, I don't think that same assumption rings true. But more important than the cost, um, and this is what we've really talked to DOJ about is, you know, can you ensure those families of these individuals that the care that they will receive will be equal or better? Um, because if I was their family member, I would fight tooth and nail if I didn't believe that the care was at least going to be, you know, the same. Um, and so, you know, what we've been concerned with is the Central Virginia Training Center is the largest and has 400 individuals. Um, is and in all parts of the state is one many have been there so long they do not have family that if they're from Northern Virginia they're still there and so will they remain in Lynchburg and are there group homes ICFMRs um, that will spring up you know because it, it, I mean there are individuals God bless them who you know are in this business 
um, of treating these individuals, uh, treating um, individuals with these severe disabilities, um, and there are no guarantees. Um, you know, we would do everything we could as a state, and that would be spelled out in any agreement to try to ensure that you know that they, you know, would, would go there. But um, at the end of the day, you know, I think we would be hard pressed to um, reduce the training center too far or reduce the transfer population statewide too far um, and, and leave individuals that have those types of needs um, in places that I think we're, you know, that we just, you know, if it was our family member, we wouldn't want them there. So that's, we're trying to construct the agreement. I'm, I'm a little hamstrung because we are in, I mean, we are in negotiations with them, but I can't, you know, tell you all the details about it, but we, we are uh, attempting to structure a potential agreement to ensure that those medically complex individuals are taken care of. Um, will absolutely be where they are now. That's what we don't know, and that's what we have to work out. I don't know if that helps. If I can ask a quick follow-up. Yeah, sure. I'm putting that in, in the same context as you talked about the problem we're going to have with increased uh, need for health care, mm -hmm. number of doctors and nurses and that sort of thing. You know, obviously, if you split those people up and start dividing up, you've got to have more care to go closer mm -hmm. to where they are. So I'm just wondering how that all is going to play out. You're talking about not just the facility itself. With the ability to provide the care. Yeah, yeah, and and one thing you know, just I mean, he asked about you know how do you get and, and this is a, this is probably the, the the heart of the problem on the visitors is, is in the training center is you know it's not as though and I would probably get, you know some grief for this that dental care is a big issue with, the, with this population. Um, they it's not just like you and I going to the dentist. Um, and so there are, you know, some providers who may or may not want to take them on as patients. Um, one of the things that they've done in Northern Virginia is they have a, you know, relationships with a number of, you know, universe, colleges and universities. Um, and so they're able to provide, you know, wonderful care, dental and um, primary care right there on campus. Um, they do that in you know, most of the training centers. I think Northern Virginia has more, just by virtue of the population, has more agreements than anybody else. Do you really want to break that up? Now, the Department of Justice would say yes, um, that they need to be receiving treatment, um, you know, at Dr. Marshall's office, um, my primary care physician. Um, but the issue is we can't make, you know, individuals treated, and, and I don't want to be um, rude about it, but. These individuals, um, you know, take a long, take longer to treat than the average patient. Um, they again, they're more medically complex, and so to you know, it's just it's not the easiest thing to do. And so to build and in, in places like Southwest Virginia is a good example. Or you know, say someone goes home, we are able to, to have a home placement for them, um, and they live in Big Stone Gap, but the closest physician is 30 miles away, which is possible. Well, that's not like 30 miles to be in Richmond to where I'm just driving, you know, 30 minutes. Um, you know, that 30 miles with this individual could take an hour and a half or two hours, and it could be over two mountains. Um, you know, those are the types of things that we're really, as we push back with the Department of Justice, we're trying to help them to understand. And I do mean the help, because they haven't been to all the training centers. They haven't, you know, seen what we've seen. Um, and, and it's just, it's, it's, you know, everybody sitting there, they just not get it, they just, you know, no, they just believe what they believe, and that doesn't make them, you know, bad people. Um, and so I do think, you know, the length of the, the negotiations has been because we have spent more time educating instead of actual back and forth, you know, negotiating this, you know, we'll do this if you do this, you know, that type of thing. So, you know, we're working on it. Um, but it will not, I, I don't expect that anybody's going to get a gold medal um, that works for the federal or state government after this process is over. Um, it is truly one of those situations where I know more people will get care, I know we'll have a better system, um, but it, you know, the plenty of people will be upset with, with the end result. I just, I, and, and I don't want um, it's just, it's never going to be, it's not going to be for any of those folks. Any other questions? Are there any other topics that you know, that y'all were wondering about that I just didn't hit on. I'm prone to have amnesia every once in a while. Did you, did you hit on the reduction in uh, CSA spending last year? And the reasons why? Uh, the reasons why, um, the, the biggest, you know, reduction in my understanding has been 
that we hit, we reduce the mat, we reduce the incentive um, going into, <clears throat> for lack of better term, group homes, and we're you know pushing more kids <clears throat> out in the community settings. You know that, but it's still at the end of the day is I don't we, we haven't figured out if that's the right policy or not. Um, that was implemented during Go, um, Governor Kane's administration, and uh, a lot of you probably you know very familiar you know with that effort that. Um, it was really, you know, um, First Lady um, came that you know that took that on, um, and, and we're just not we're not convinced that that's the best you know, that's the best policy. Um, I think that it was the Casey Foundation that you know that worked on a, on a lot of those things. Um, again, I think they did a lot of good work, but um, we, we really tried to um, it was the children's transformation effort. We really tried to move more away from that and, and say, you know, let's not, you know using the word reform, using the word transformation, that type of thing. Let's just get a handle on, you know, where the money's going. Um, and if it's, you know, any, and if, if, if all the kids that need treatment are getting treatment, because we really can't answer that, answer that question right now. Um, so, yes, sir. Well, how are you going about analyzing it? Are you going into the communities and uh, finding out how it's working? Because I know in Phil Pepper, we seem to be having some positive results from that scenario of, of moving it into the community. It was a difficult transition, but uh, I think we're starting to see some, some positive things, particularly with the involvement of the judge. Um, you know, if the judge is in, interested in it and, and interested in, in pursuing it, uh, I think it can work out. So I don't know, how, how are you, from your your position, how are you analyzing what you're working on? Yeah, well, again, we're at the very beginning of this, so whether it's, whether what's, well, I'm sorry, whether what's working or not, the, 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 the transition to community-based oh, okay. as opposed to uh, residential-based. Yeah, and, and that's where I don't think, we, we don't have the data to show us if, if it actually is working or not, or no, if we basically just disincentivize, you know, folks to be treated in one setting that's cheaper. Um, it's just because, again, just because it's cheaper doesn't mean that it's better. Um, and so, We've got Susie Clare, who's on, who was who is now the head of the Office of Comprehensive Services, and she started. She may have only done about two months, and so what she's going to be doing is convening stakeholders, many of which will be local representatives, to try to figure out, okay, if we're going to begin to collect this data, what's the appropriate way um, to do that? If we're going to move toward a care coordination model, um, you know, what if we were to move that way? What could we do? You know, the, and again, if there are some best practices out there that, that are already being done, you know, we can look at that. Um, sometimes those best practices, you know, they don't, they're best practice for a particular locality, but you know, can they be expanded? Would they work statewide? You know, we don't know that um, and, and until we begin to look. I don't think I answered the question. Um, I don't know. I guess I guess my question is, uh, how do we help you analyze it? Okay. I don't know how else to say it. Uh, I mean, you kind of sort of glossed over it as well. We're not sure where it's going. Or, or well, it's it's, 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 it's it's the beginning of the process of beginning to look at look at how we do it. So if you want to tell us a, a you know a way that's worked for y'all, we would be happy to, to look at that. Does that? I don't. I mean. Yeah, I think I think that's a start. Yeah, and I, and I think the problem is it's not the beginning of the process for the localities. That's been what twenty years. Well, no, this transition. Yeah, no, but I mean it's. it's they, these, are you saying these, these, these issues have been there for twenty years? Is that what you're saying? Yes, they. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I'll acknowledge that. You know, I, again, I can only go from the point yeah. that we've started. You know, this. But what kind of data are you looking for? Yeah, and that's that's getting deeper than I know okay. in the program. So we can. You know, I'll be happy to get your card and you know look at that um, and get you in touch with Susie and we'll start it. Again, the Governor Reform Commission just met today, and so this will be a recommendation that you know that they that they'll pass on to the governor. And so we'll begin to you know, we're beginning to get we'll begin to get the stakeholders together on that. So nothing's being done, the question nothing's being done right now, but it's something that we would like to do in the future. And so we're going to have to work with y'all to figure out how to do. It, I mean, just to follow up on that, no, it, 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 it was a very difficult transition that we went through. I mean, there were a lot of issues that we had to work through in our local community anyway to 
provide services. In fact, at the time, it, I believe the legislation has changed now that that allows services from other communities if you don't have services to get to share some things. But uh, so that was really difficult. The services weren't actually about. I mean, they weren't there. Yet we had to find them locally. Um, so we've really worked hard to get to that point. Um, it wasn't an easy transition, and I sure hope that if we, if we go to a different direction, uh, the state helps more with that transition. <coughs> so the, if you're saying that you've got a system that it sounds like it's working for you, uh, you, know, don't, we, you don't want us to come in and try to fix something that's not broken? Is that, is that a fair statement? If you do better, that's great. <laughs> but but uh, sort of understand, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and write the check for it. And write the check for it. Yeah. <laughs> and one size won't fit all. Right, right. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, that's fair. Um, what I'm here, at least what I'm here on this is, is that, you know, we, we've got to do, um, as we do our communication, we make sure that y'all are the which is, which is an assumption that, you know, that we would reach out to y'all. So, so those of y'all who, I'm hearing some volunteers. Um, you know, that they're willing to, I'll follow up with you after, after we get to make sure I've got your name, I'll pass them along to the, to the new director and she can get back in touch. And, and I think what sure. you're going to find, you know, just telling me about her, said one, one size won't fit all. I mean, I think even collectively, we're in the process, based on August that have been going on, we're in the process of trying to try to revamp our program. And you know, you got so many different stakeholders at the table. Okay, during these policy setting um, sessions that everyone has a different interest. Okay, and collectively we can all agree on the fact that we need to, our system isn't working. We're not basically changing behaviors. It's, it's basically following generation to generation to generation. We're servicing the same demographics. And um, it, while raising, I mean, escalating costs because you having so many of these folks on here um, that are partaking of the services. And, and I don't, there's very little guidance available now. So when you talk about looking at outcomes, I think it's hard even based on the information that's being collected internally to measure those. It's going to, we're going to be hard pressed to come up with some measurable outcomes and a system that's working to break the cycle because we're not getting to these, to these kids fast enough. You know, and, and at some points, it almost feels like you're perpetuating the abuse that they're with the community-based services. So. Plus, you have resources that differ between Fairfax and Pittsburgh Gap and Nelson County that are significantly different. Um, plus, you're dealing with human beings. Mm -hmm. They don't work off of the to give you a set resource on a particular twist. Well, it doesn't change. But if I just tag on to yeah. that, um, Keith, um, can you, you would add, I guess part of my question is can you talk about the CANS system that was put in as part of the transition? As I understood it from one of the um, SEC meetings that I attended um, a few months back, uh, we're, we're starting to get the results as, as more data is in the system now. For a couple of years, but they received a report, um, first level analysis of the data, but it's beginning to be able to be analyzed to show how the return is being experienced. You know, for a long time, the CSA was like we heard guys, for example, from the Department of Juvenile Justice say, "Now I can't quantify it for you, but I know it's making a difference because we're seeing fewer kids." You know. I know it's because CSA, be really careful if you do anything with CSA because we know this part's working somehow. And this was supposed to be helping us to see some of the quantification of that, you know, through its, through its methodologies. I know it's a new data system, nobody likes data systems, you need to have to enter data in anything, no matter what the data system is. Everybody's going to complain about that, but this one has got some track record from other states, it's one of the reasons chosen here. Can you tell us what is being done now to analyze this two years of data to take us another step further on how we are doing with our diagnosis and matching it up with 
good care. That's part of what I understood Kansas was going to show us. Yeah, and, no, and I'm not that familiar with the Kansas system. So, but you know, we can, you know, I'll, I, what we can do is get get back with Susie or Karen, who has <laughs> is within our office, and talk about that. I, I'm sorry, I don't have, you know, greater knowledge on it. But what I am hearing, and, and I'm not surprised because I was warned about it, uh, is that there, are, um, because I, I don't want to be the elephant in the room, is that. You know, anytime we, we use the word transformation reform, um, and I think the words, I think CSA reform has probably been a little overused, um, and we probably haven't done a very good job of controlling, um, you know, the, um, you know, the, uh, the best way to describe it. it we, we probably, um, you know, should have had a tighter package together before we began to, to discuss certain things. I think what happened was the folks have had ideas. Um, and that everybody is saying, okay, well, we hear you're doing this, we hear you're doing that, and candidly, it might have just been something that occurred in, in one conversation or two. Um, I'm not the lead on the on um, on CSA. The other deputy, Matt Cobb, is, and he just he would be skeptical be here. He's at the uh, Virginia Executive Institute. Couldn't get out of that. But you know, one thing that again, and this is to you know, the gentleman in the back to address what he's talking about is that. There have not been final decisions made on any of the things that you may or may not have heard. Um, any of the current you know, system changes that have occurred over the past couple of years, you know, we're done with the Kane administration. It doesn't mean that we don't own them and that we're not carrying them out. And, but we do want to make sure that they are not um, adversely affecting the system. If they're working great, um, because I think there has been a lot of, in my understanding, has been a lot of you know, change in the system. And, we are never going to know what's working if you keep, you know, you know, moving things around. And so, again, um, I would ask you as you look at the recommendations that come out of the Government Reform Commission, um, you know, get in touch with our office. And you know, we're very easy. You know, you can go through Dean. I'll give you my card today, and I'll point you in the right direction. Whether it be Susie or Karen Addison or or Matt Cobb, and please, you know, take the time to give us the, the feedback like, you know, we've done today. We really genuinely need that. Um, that will help us to get around the potholes that are in the road. And we know that they're there. Chief, um, I think it's fair to say that, that folks from the local government side aren't opposed to change if it's, if it's worked out and it's, you know, it's an effort to try to improve the system. We can always improve the system. Mm -hmm. I'd like for you to, to take one message back and that we're both paying for this. There's 40% roughly local dollars in this. And so if we're going to do something to save money, we're going to do something to make it more efficient, it should work for both partners and not just for one. It's going to save the state money, it needs to save local government money. It should not be a shift in right. Well, and I hope y'all, I hope Governor McDonald has shown that you know he's not, you know, whether it's a mandate or what they're talking about the federal government right now, which is we're going to change the match rate for Medicaid, which would be terrible. We change it two percent, and um, all the things that we talked about today are just in, in, in flux, and that doesn't save the federal government money. Like that again, just a push down. Um, and so we'll try to avoid that. And so there's four hundred twenty-five thousand some odd people that. that I think this is at least the third session I've been in in the last two days that mentioned that. That seems to be scaring the Jesus out of everybody. Now, the assumption then is that everyone that is not covered is all of a sudden going to rush out and get dental and medical treatment. Is that, I'm not a real bright guy, I'm kind of slow. Is that, is that what you're basing on? Well, the new Secretary they, Brown, et cetera? Yeah, if they don't, then they have to begin to, they, again, a little mandate. They'll have to have, They'll have to go to the exchange or wherever and get insurance. But you're so, assuming then these 425, many of them probably uh, know that they can go to the emergency rooms now, right. uh, are all of a sudden going to change their habits and rush out to get this medical treatment the, the, for, for whatever reason right. they don't now. Either they're proud, they don't want to accept that kind of, mm -hmm. or they don't know. So your assumption is all of a sudden there's going to be you know, perfect knowledge on the part of these people and they're going to rush out and, and, and get this care which will cost the state and local a lot of money, but what are you basing that? Yeah. What, what, 
Well, it won't, it won't, it won't be 425,000 people who show up on day one. Um, there will be, you know, there will be a, you know, an uptick that will be taken that into account in our analysis. Again, it's 270 and 425. So, you know, it's not an exact science. Um, I also mentioned the fact that there are a million uninsured in the state, um, some of which make over the 138% of the federal poverty level. And so, you know, they're just not going to to fall into this. Um, there are also a number of individuals within that 425,000, and we call it the Woodward effect, that already qualify for Medicaid under our very stringent requirements that we have, and they, you know, they're going to come out of the Woodward, um, but we don't know how fast they're going to come out of the Woodward. Um, for the state, it'd be better if they're a little slow about it, but candidly, if they're, you know, legally they can receive the benefit, um, you know, we want them to get their health insurance because it's cheaper for us if they get the care that they need. There's no argument about that. I mean, if everybody can have health insurance and it didn't break the bank, you know, no problem. Um, but, it, you know, I, that, that's part of the analysis. Some people won't. Some people just, you know, they'll continue to go to the, the hospital, they'll continue to get their treatment, um, and they'll be told, you know, We'll run your eligibility requirements, they'll be told that they qualify for Medicaid, they'll be told they need to go to the exchange and do this, but they won't do it. Um, and, we, and we won't stop that. But that's not part of the 425,000 or 470. Again, we believe it's the, you know, the higher end of that. Um, but we think that you know, we've got a pretty good you know, handle on how many people will be dealing with. Again, we just don't know the end. You know, when they'll be there. The exchange is supposed to be called beta testing up and running in 2013. And so again, you know, we're ending 2011. The feds haven't told us what this exchange is supposed to look like, what are the requirements, and we're supposed to have something up and running in about a year or so. So you said the third time you've heard this, I'm obviously harping on it um, a lot. And so to say the word scare is probably not the best word. I would hope that engage is what it is engage on this. Um, because we're not seeing the engagement at, from the locale. I don't want to say, we're not seeing the engagement from anybody except the usual players in healthcare. And we're kind of surprised by that. And we're not trying to get everybody all in the tizzy. We're just saying we need to properly prepare for this, and we don't want to do it in a vacuum. Um, but we just don't. You know, all the agencies all, and the secretary and the governor don't want to do that in a vacuum. Yes, sir? It's kind of working backwards because you're saying the feds haven't given it to you. Right. right? Have you given it to us? Have we given you, I'm sorry, the, the same guidance that the feds haven't given you? <laughs> we we want the guidance to give you, but... Um, you gotta show what I'm saying. There can't be a huge reaction on our part until we know some more of the detail. Okay. And so a lot of it is the feds haven't given it to you. You've given the same thing to us, which is it's coming, but we don't know the parameters. Right. Until we know the parameters, <laughs> We can't overreact. Is that, and then I'll ask you a question, group. is that kind of where y'all are at? Is that y'all just don't know which way to move? Okay, wait. Is that, is that, yeah, it's just a wait to see. That's fine. I, mean, I got a quick question in terms of uh, somebody said day one. Uh, is there just um, one day all of a sudden everybody can apply, or is it going to be stretched out over a year? Um, they can, yeah, they can. We'll have to turn the system on, I believe it's January 1. We'll have to turn the exchange on. January 1, 2014. Yeah, these 425 yeah. or 375, they can't just show up day one, can they? Um, there'll, be a, there'll be a period, and I don't know, I forget what the date is, I'm sorry, I don't have that on. But, uh, you know, they, they can well, apply alphabetically, or there's, they get a number or something, I mean, everybody can't just show up at their, at our uh, social services department and go, I want to sign up. Technically they could, but we, I don't anticipate that's going to happen. That would be a disaster. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Is there going to be any money or staff in there or anything? To That's, are y'all going to receive any money or staff? <laughs> 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 yeah. All these large, 100,000 people? Yeah. Um, <laughs> wish I'd better get on that. You're probably going to get about as much money as we're getting to, <laughs> um, to take care of. I mean, what I've been yeah. hearing, what I've been hearing, that people are just going to go to some portal, they're all going to get online, they're all going to why? I, I'm a halfway intelligent guy. I can't figure out my own prescription drug program without getting help. So all these people can just go do that? Yeah. No. Are they going to come to the social, local social service agencies yes. and apply? Yes. Yes. So, and, that, and, that's, and, 
What well, but the, and that's but the 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 portal will you know your your staff's gonna and we're again this they, is a they're normal. overwhelmed now. Well, mean, hopefully the, the system portal coming. They're overwhelmed. We right. do need the portal. I will yeah, the portal is great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not right. part of that because they're overwhelmed. Right. Thousands of people they have. Right. And without the portal, we're working on adopting the system. Yeah. Right. You're, you're killing us. So if you get the portal out well ahead of time, we may have the opportunity to train and be comfortable and try to go faster or have it cross check. Yeah, and that's and that's the that's the idea. And we can you know tell you or may not. Trying to think about maybe there's an opportunity to know I'm getting ready to get the hook where we can do some education on y'all about what the timetable is for how the board is going to roll out. Because maybe that's what I'm here to you know, the people in. So, yeah. Is that, is that a good way to end it? If any people, I mean. Yeah, questions? Comments?